Let us come before our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word, your word which is the truth, which has everything in it that we need to live by, to be, to be obedient to you, Lord, and to enjoy the most of life. Lord, we just pray that this morning as we look into your word for practical um, principles that we can live by, Lord, that you would just bless our time together and that you would uh, open our hearts, Lord, and help us to understand the lessons from your word this morning. We ask these things in Christ's name and for his sake, amen. A father says to his son, you better get ready or you'll be late for Sunday school. And the boy asks, Dad, did you go to Sunday school when you were a boy? And Dad says, yes, I did. And the boy said as he was getting dressed, well, it probably won't do me any good either. Now, if you were here last week, you may remember that we learnt that children are given to us by God as a reward. They're given to us as a blessing for us to love and enjoy. But along with that, we're also given a responsibility and we're asked to command, or we're commanded to teach wisdom that comes from God and to lead them to the foot of the cross with, by our life's example. The objective or the target the goal of parenting, of all parenting, but especially Christian parenting, is that they may live lives worthy of God. We should never lose sight of the fact that our children are gifts from God who are simply on loan for us for a few years. They are not ours, they belong to him. And we have both the privilege and responsibility of bringing them up to be healthy, functioning adults who love and serve God. This is the main person, main, main sorry, purpose of Christian parenthood. One of the main biblical principles that we need to teach our children from the get-go is that they need to learn obedience. Children will sin. Why? Because, like us, they are born into sin as a direct result of what happened in the Garden of Eden. Training your children, however, is less about dealing with their behaviour and far more to do about training their hearts, their motives and their attitudes. For those of you that were at camp this year, uh, you might remember Franz talking <coughs> about dealing with sin in our lives, but not only the sins that we see on the outside, but to look within and to find out our motives. Uh, what are the sins of the heart that drive us to do the sins that other people see in us? There's this little boy who was playing up in church. His mother told him to sit down and be quiet. So eventually the little boy sat down, but as he did so, he told his mother, I'm sitting down on the outside, but I'm still standing on the inside. When they disobey you, don't tell your children that they've been naughty. Tell them that they have sinned. They have been naughty for sure, but call it for what it is. When they disobey, uh, disobey a right instruction, they're sinning against you and they're sinning against God. So remind them of that. Paul in Ephesians 6 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Submissive children obey their parents, and Jesus himself, when he was a child, sets the example when he subjected himself to his own parents on earth. While compliance in your children's behaviour is both needed and required, it is the training of the heart that's the most important for us as parents training that eventually points to Christ. So who are our children to be obedient to? Uh, well, we just read in Ephesians 6 once, it's the parents. But if you look at that verse more closely, it says that children should obey their parents in the Lord. Those in our charge should obey us as if they're obeying God. And they are led by us if we are obeying God. 
The goal for your child is to obey both on the outside and the inside, as to the Lord himself. This principle of obedience is further reinforced a few verses on in Ephesians 6. In verse 5, it's, Paul says, Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleases, but of slaves of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. Obedience to authority applies not only to our children, but to all of us. God has placed people in authority over us, which we must also be subject to. This is why our example to children is so important. So I think we all understand that God wants us to teach our children to be obedient. But we as parents often make things worse in our attempts in that training, often relying on our own experience and our own wisdom than relying on God's word for how to parent. So which one of the following parents are you like? Are you like the um, count to three parent? You'd probably be quite familiar with this one. This is one I practiced in earlier days. This is the one that says to your child, do something, and they hesitate and think about it. So you say one, two, and they're sitting there. And then all of a sudden they jump and run. They know that because when I get to three, they know they're in huge trouble. But you understand that in the meantime, they've actually disobeyed me twice. And I've helped them to do that. Instant obedience is not the only kind of obedience there is. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Train your children to obey you the first time you ask them, for this is right. Don't encourage them to sin by disobeying you a few times first, and don't you sin by training in disobedience. By the way, if you've been a one, two, three parent and you want to change the, the, this regime, it's actually not too difficult to do. You'll find that your kids are quite happy with the change. They will take to it like water, duck to water. But um, often this is more difficult for the parents because it's so entrenched in the way often that we've been brought up. However, this change brings an outcome that is quite dramatic and it really aids to peace in the home. Maybe you're the uh, threatening parent or the repeating parent. You know, the one they first coax then they yell, threaten, repeat the instruction a few times over, then they bargain, then they pretend to punish, and in the end, they might punish you just a little. Now, this can only frustrate your child. You don't have to yell or threaten your child. Your child needs to be taken to the cross where they can be taught to ask for forgiveness. This is something that you cannot do while you're yelling at them and threatening them. The next time you hear fighting in another room, don't shout out, knock it off, or I'll give you something to scream about. Just remember that they're not just naughty, they're sinning. And this is no longer about them obeying you. It's about their heart before the Lord. But maybe you're the bribing parent. The bribing parent uh, bribes, maybe bribes their children with a Fredo frog or the like. This is an excellent way of getting compliance. Works every time except it's a totally wrong way. Typically a bribe is offered in the middle of some sort of tantrum or some other bad behaviour, usually in a public place, and it's wrong because you're buying their compliance and the response is not genuine, more from the heart. Bribing is giving your children a reward for behaving badly. In turn, this teaches them that if they scream for 20 minutes or so, they'll get pretty well anything they want. And the next time they want something, you have taught them how to get it. Just scream and chuck a tantrum, and eventually you'll give it to them. Your children are not responding out of obedience of you or respect of you. They are obedient because they will get something from you. You want your children to obey you because it's the right thing to do. And when you bribe your child, you may win the battle, but you've lost the war. Now, rewards are a little different to bribing. A reward is something that you give your child in recognition of something 
that they've done or achieved, usually after the event, because they're not expecting it, you see. Parent, it's, a, it's a parent initiated and it's given in recognition of a child's effort, like maybe you know, doing well at school or being really well behaved in a particular day or doing jobs without asking. Rewarding a child can be as simply as recognising and complimenting them or it can be something more tangible. A reward done rightfully is a real encouragement for the child to do good and it gives them a taste for righteousness. The easier, the easier you can make it for your child to obey you, the more success you will have in achieving an obedient child. When you tell your child to either do something or not to do something, you should expect and demand an immediate response. You can give them a choice or you can give them a command, but don't be ambiguous between the two. If you want Tommy to clean up his room, don't say, Tommy, would you like to clean up your room? because he probably won't like to. If you want him to clean up his room, you need to tell him that that's what's required. We had a son who was very clever at splitting hairs with ambiguous and even quite clear instructions. I'm actually surprised he didn't turn up to be a lawyer. Never give children instructions unless you intend for it to be obeyed. I've seen this recently when I was in a doctor's surgery. This mother came in with her young boy and uh, initially he sat down next to her but after a while he wandered over to the drink dispenser, the cold water drink dispenser and started playing with it playing with the tap pulling cups out of the dispenser and mother says, whatever his name was stop that don't do that, come back and sit here well the child just uh, totally ignored that and just kept playing with the drink dispenser and kept playing with that and this went on for about five minutes or so before I had to leave and um, every so often the mother would say, stop it, come back here. Tommy, stop it, whatever his name was. And you just keep doing that. There's no better way to teach your child not to obey you than to give instructions that you have no intention of enforcing. You can make it easier for your children to obey if you give them a heads up. For instance, in our family, we got into the habit of giving a five or 10 minute warning before a meal. We would tell the kids that uh, dinner in five or dinner in ten. And this would allow them to have the opportunity to finish what they were doing if they were watching television or playing games or whatever they were doing. They had this opportunity to prepare rather than to actually announce dinner right on the knocker and expect them to stop their TV show right in the middle or to stop their game right in the middle. This just frustrates the child. So make it easy for them to obey you. Don't be legalistic. Consider the context of the moment. A legalist is concerned about the letter of the law, not the purpose of the law. Legalism rejects context and makes it difficult for your kids to comply with your instructions. Take into account the context of the moment. If you have a child that has difficulty focusing when you're instructing them, teach them to look at you or to make eye contact while you're speaking to them. When you have uh, told them what they must do, ask them to say, yes, mum, yes, dad. This way they have, acknowledged, they have acknowledged that they have heard you and they have agreed to do what you've asked of them. If you have a really young child, you can even hold their face to get eye contact while you're talking to them. Now, if you have children like mine, you will find out that your children don't comply with your instructions because they simply forget that you've told them to do something. Now they do this because your instructions weren't that important to them in the first place. So just understand that forgetting to do what they are told to do is the same thing as choosing not to remember what they've been told to do. If you had promised to take them out somewhere, there is no way they'd forget that. So they have the ability to remember things. Train them to do that we would hold our children accountable for failing to remember to do something that they were asked to do. As far as possible, when you give instructions to your children, explain to them the reason why you're telling them to do this or that thing. And if possible, tie it in with scripture. You could say, chew with your mouth closed, I don't want to see what you're eating. Or you could say, 
You remember how Jesus answered the Pharisees when they asked him what the greatest commandment is? We are to love God with all our might and to love our neighbour as ourselves. And this is why we don't choose with our mouth open because some people find it gross. And we love our neighbour and we don't want to irritate them. You could say, be nice to your sister, I'll teach you a thing or two about being mean. Or you could go back to that and say, do you remember when we talked about loving our neighbour as ourselves? Do you think you're obeying God's command when you're mean to your sister? So give reasons so that your children know that there's no hidden agenda in what you're telling them to do, that it's a godly instruction and it's for their, best, it's for their um, well-being. Now, sometimes, or well, most of the time when your children are young, your children will disobey your instructions and some form of discipline is needed. Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up a child in the way he will go, or he should go, and even when he is old he will not depart from it. I heard a story relating to this verse. It's about, it's about a horse, or breaking in a horse. When a horse is being broken in, uh, some, at some stage in the process, they stick a bridle over its head and they stick a bit in its mouth. A horse doesn't like the bit. It's very unnatural for a horse to have a bit in its mouth. And he fights it, and he fights it. But after a while, he gets used to the bit being there, and, uh, and, and he settles down. Then uh, someone hops on the back of the horse, and they want to then direct the horse using that bit. At first, uh, they want the horse to go in a certain direction. The horse has his own ideas. He wants to go where he wants to go. So the rider pulls on the, on the reins, and the bit bites into the mouth of the horse, causing some pain. The horse doesn't like this, of course, and initially fights it. But after a while, he understands that if he turns his head in the direction of which it's being pulled, it doesn't hurt so much. And eventually, of course, uh, the rider has control over the horse because the horse has learnt the path of least pain. Now, the same, context, the same concept applies to the obedience in your children. Sometimes a little pain is required to protect them from heading in the wrong direction and to correct their course. When it comes to discipline, you have another, another a number of options available to you to help correct your children. It may be that you send them to their room for a while or isolate them from other children for a little while or maybe take away their favourite toy. That causes pain. Or it may be that if the transgression is serious enough, physical discipline may be needed. Discipling your child may involve consequences including physical discipline, but Christian discipline should never be dispensed without discipleship as the overarching goal. Spare the rod and spoil the child is a statement I'm sure you've heard. It basically means that if you don't discipline a rebellious child, that child will be a spoiled brat. This saying comes from Proverbs 13.24, which says, He who withholds his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. The Lord disciples and disciplines us to reveal our sin to us, and this is how we reveal the need of a saviour to our children. If your children do not feel any consequence for their sin, then they will not understand that sin requires punishment. The Lord provides a way of salvation and forgiveness through Jesus, but that means little to those who do not see their sin. Correction shows us that we are accountable for our actions, our pride, blinds us to our need for a saviour and discipline reveals our wretchedness. Children who respect authority and feel sorrow for their sin are much more likely to ask Jesus to forgive them and be saved. Children are born in sin and left to their own devices they will become destructive and unrighteous. They are not born with any natural goodness in them and this is why discipline is so important. Proverbs 22.15 says, Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will remove it far from him. Now you will know even as adults that if, that if we do not learn from correction, we will feel the consequences of our foolishness. 
a proper balance is needed between verbal reproof and the application of corporal punishment. Proverbs 29.15 says, The rod and the reproof give wisdom, but a child who gets his own way brings shame to his mother. And verse 17 says, Correct your son, and he will give you comfort, and he will delight your soul. So there's an important balance between positive instruction, encouragement, and nurturing in conjunction with the appropriate physical punishment. Pray for wisdom that you may find this balance. Physical discipline is the most intense and humbling form of correction that you can give a child. Therefore, it should be used with great care, maintaining the dignity of the child while at the same time teaching them about God's love. I've got a list here of some do nots. This is some do nots that you shouldn't do when you're, when you're training or particularly disciplining your children. Do not exasperate your children. Obviously, this comes from Ephesians 6 and other places. While this is addressed to fathers, I think the principle applies to, to both parents. Exasperating your children can be done by anything that provokes your child to a righteous anger, like if you are too severe or unreasonable, if you set them up for failure in your instructions or make cruel demands or apply needless restrictions. Maybe you are a bit like me when I was younger and you were self-righteous, never admitting to your child that you had fault or that you had made a mistake. Such provocation can deaden your child's affection for you and it can reduce their desire for holiness and make them feel like there's nothing that they can do to please you. Be wise parents and make obedience desirable and attainable by love and gentleness. Do not lash out at your child out of frustration or anger. Your children will surely push you to that point. But don't sin in responding to to that. If they have been told something and they have rebelled seriously enough to warrant discipline, then send them to their room while you gather your thoughts. If possible, if your spouse is present, maybe you can sit down together and discuss what has been done and the appropriate consequences that are required. Then go to them, lovingly discuss with them what they did wrong and talk about their heart issues that made them do that. And whether they ask for forgiveness or not, they still need to pay the consequences. Be age appropriate. uh, Discipline for toddlers may just require a little smack or a little smarting on the wrist. And for toddlers too, You can't wait, it has to be done straight away because otherwise they'll forget what it is you're smacking them for or punishing them for. Do not harm your child. The idea of the rod is not to bring pain, pain, sorry, the idea of the rod is to bring pain but not cause injury. This is not child abuse, it's no excuse for using a, a device on your child that would cause them injury. Use a device that achieves this purpose. In our home, we settled for a fly swat, plastic fly swat. No, it wasn't the nice fat soft end, it was the the handle end. And um, this gave a nice smarting sting, but it didn't cause any injury because it was light and flexible. Parents, if you're going to use a device on your child, I'd recommend that you give the device to your child before you use it and ask them to try it on you. This way then you will appreciate what it feels like and you will have some understanding of the pain you're inflicting on your child. Then you can both cry together. Do not yell or verbally abuse your children. Simply said, this is not Christ-like and it doesn't bring Christ any honour. Do not threaten, bribe or continually repeat your instructions to your children. Ask them quietly and train them in obedience. Do not belittle your children or embarrass them, particularly in public. 
deal with them when you get home. Do not compare your children to their, with their siblings or with anyone else's children. This can be very damaging because they can never measure up. This was an uh, experience I had my growing up myself. There was a, another person, a son of another man, who was always the one that I got compared to. Why can't you be like this person? So don't do that. Ensure that punishment fits the crime. Too much punishment will exasperate your child. It will frustrate them. It will provoke them to a righteous anger. Not enough punish, not an, uh, not, uh, enough punishment or not a solid enough punishment will not bring about the change of the heart that you're after. And finally, also, choose your hill to die on. Um, sometimes you're going to get into a power play with a child. This child is just not going to, he's going to be stubborn and he's just not going to give in to you. Choose your battles. Choose your battles. Be wide. Try, try not to corner your child in such a place. And if you do get there, try and find some way in which the child can escape with some dignity. And most important, do not fail to discipline your children when it's needed and encourage them when they do good. Now, when a child does something wrong, their God-given conscience often convicts them of their sin. The result of this is that they feel guilt. This is good. They should. And guilt makes them feel very uncomfortable. Discipline is very effective in relieving a child of their guilt when done rightly. It allows for them to pay the price and remove the guilt from them. Once they have received their punishment, the price has been paid, all is forgotten. The guilt is gone and the child's relationship with their parents is restored. I feel really sorry for those kids that have never been disciplined and hence are walking around carrying that guilt. Some of the closest and most precious times I've had with my children is immediately after they've been disciplined. They have transgressed. They have broken to a degree the relationship between us in that they have maybe been deceptive or done something they were told not to do. But then they've been disciplined and they've paid the price. They've learnt their lesson. They understand that as much as it pains me and them, the consequences must be applied for their good. This is something that you have to do because you love them and you only want what's best for them. Then there's restoration, and this is the goal of discipline. Restoration of the relationship between God and his parents, sorry, between the child and his parents, and ultimately restoration with God. Let me read you from Hebrews 12.4. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding, so you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons, which is, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you have been reproved by him. For though for those whom the Lord loves he disciplines, and he scourges every son he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our own good, so that we may share in his holiness. All discipline for the moment may not seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful, and yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Every interaction with your child should have an overarching goal. 
that your words and your actions would lead them to love and fear the Lord more than they currently do. For us, no discipline feels good at the time, but the rewards are rich. Godly character, fruit of the Spirit, and peace are rewards of God's discipline. And the same is true when it comes to our children. Children who have been trained to take the responsibility for their actions are much happier and well-balanced children. The rod of correction steers the heart of a child towards Jesus and his forgiveness. Another thing you can train your child in is that of otherness or respect for others. Paul in his letter to the Philippians says in chapter 2 verse 3, do nothing from selfish or empty conceit but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Now selfishness is one thing your children specialise in and from the moment they're born uh, their entire world interest is in themselves. Your task as parents is to teach them to respect God and his word. You, your parents, their siblings, people who are above them in authority, like teachers, adults, bosses, police, government, particularly older people and other people's property and domain. An outworking of Philippians 2.3 is that you consider others more important than yourselves and this is something you should change your children. It's a story of, um, of, of someone who invited a couple and their children over to their home. Um, while there, the mother took one of the children into another room and found a couple of old books of yours that she thought might be good for the children to play with. After they had left the home a bit later, you discover that these children had badly damaged these books. Now, they're only old books in the first place and they had little value. But the problem with this is that the mother made the decision that those old books had no value and gave them to her, to her children to play with. Now, while those books of yours were old and had little monetary value, what that mother didn't know is that these books were yours from when you were a child and you'd had them all that time and they held a special place in your heart. So the principle here is that the value of something, someone's property, is not the value you place on it. The value of someone's property is the value that they place on it, they being the owner. The value of something is what it's worth to its owner. So this is a good principle to teach your children that they need to respect other, respect other people's property regardless of its value. Why? because they need to learn not to be selfish but to consider others more important. Now the same principle applies to respecting people. Some people may be of good standing, uh, upright citizens in the community, maybe of good repute, and there may be other people that maybe live on the streets or are involved in crime or, or drug addiction. All these people have value, but it's not the value we place on them, it's the value that the owner places on them, which is our Lord. He created them and he would have them turn to him and be saved. People are of great value to God and so we too should treat all people in the same manner that Christ would. So this is a good principle to teach your children, respect for people. To respect people the same way God, their creator, would treat them. They are very special and precious to God and even the rapist and the murderer can be forgiven by God and spend eternity with him. Another principle to teach your children is that of respect for the aged. In Leviticus 19.32, we read that you shall rise up before the grey-headed and honour the aged. In the child's case, anyone who is an adult is worthy of respect simply because they are older, hopefully wiser and experienced. A five-year-old and a 25-year-old are not peers. Time makes a difference. One is hopefully wiser than the other and more experienced and is worthy of that respect. 
in the same way a 15-year-old is not a peer to a 50-year-old. Time has not made them equal. And because of these many years of experience, respect is right and proper. So how can you teach your children to show respect for older people? How can children demonstrate that respect? In places like, particularly like Japan, where they have quite a, an honour system, they bow to each other. It's a sign of respect. It's something that is tangible that people can see. A good time-honoured way in our culture was to have your children address older people as Mr or Mrs, or even Miss to even single women. This trains your child to show respect for people that have just been around a lot longer. And even for those a little older, they could just use Miss in their first name. The same principle applies to parents. Have your ch children call you mum and dad, not address you by your first name. Mum and dad, that relationship is the only, you know, you only have one mum and you only have one dad. That relationship is very special. And uh, they're not your equals, they are your children. Uh, allow them to show respect for you by calling you by their, your proper title. There are people that I know that are older than me that I still call Mr and Mrs. Having said that, uh, they're a lot less nowadays um, as they're all dying off and I'm getting old. When you trust God's way over that which seems right for you, you will see blessing in you and your children. Don't be swayed by the world when it comes to raising your children. The world has no interest in raising godly children. The world's wisdom is opposed to God and his word and its foolishness. Peter says in 1 Peter 5.8, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Satan is after your children. And if you don't train them, he will. Untrained, they are easy fodder for him. His world system will be bombarding your children and tempting them away from the Lord. Parents, prepare them as early as you can and teach them the ways of the Lord. Our goals as parents is not just to bring them up as well-behaved children. It is our purpose for us to be obedient to God and allow him to use us to train our children's hearts to prepare them to face the world. Yes, your home can be changed from an endurance marathon with much anger, frustration and fighting to a place, a place of love and harmony, and this is good. But the end goal of our parenting is to introduce our children to the Lord Jesus Christ and with much prayer to pray for their souls. We do this by leading them by our example to the foot of the cross you cannot save your children. This is totally up to God's sovereign choice. But you can be obedient to God by faithfully raising your children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. For those here without children, all these principles that we train them must be in us first. There is nothing we are asking of these children that God hasn't already asked of us. Let us thank God for the children in our midst and invest in them by helping their parents in their duty to raise godly children. Let us pray that the Lord would save them and use them to further his kingdom, either here or in other places. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for our children. Lord, we thank you for the parents here that are charged to bring them up in in obedience to you, Lord. We just pray that you would um, be with our children, Lord, that you would cause us as a church to gather around them in such a way that, that they have uh, little doubt of your love for them, Lord, and that, that they would see in us godly people that they can um, follow as an example. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, well, this morning, um, it's my delight and joy to just uh, take part in our, our child dedication service. 
we were to have um, four families joining us this morning, but unfortunately, or five children actually, unfortunately two of those families can't be here due to circumstances that are beyond their control. But um, we do have a couple. Uh, we have uh, Levi Ward and his parents and Ethan Packard and his parents. If you guys would like to come and stand up next to me, that would be really good. Thank you. Righty ho. Well, first of all, let me tell you what we're not doing here this morning. This dedication ceremony that we're having is not an ordinance from Scripture. This is not something that we're asked to do. Uh, it is just simply something that we've decided to do uh, in a way of just recognising these children and to committing ourselves to them. It is not child baptism in any shape or form. And there's nothing supernatural in that sense happening here. This is not uh, anything special. But it is the command of God that we should diligently seek to raise our children in such a way as to lead them to trust Christ as Saviour and to serve him as Lord. In response to this command, these parents here bring their children to present them to the Lord and dedicate themselves to this task. The precedence for child dedication may be found in scripture as in the presentation of Samuel to God by Hannah in 1 Samuel 1.28 and the presentation of Jesus to God by Joseph and Mary in Luke 2.22 and Paul reminds us in Timothy uh, or sorry, reminded Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.15 he said from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are of able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith in which Christ, in which is in Christ Jesus. Jesus considered children to be very precious and in Mark 10 14 we read permit children to come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. So the purpose of child dedication is really found in the purpose of the parents rightly understood this ceremony is one of parental dedication. The parents are pledging themselves to obey the command of Paul, who in Ephesians 6.4 says children to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So folks, to, with that in mind, I have three questions or three statements which I'll read out to you. And if you agree with these statements, you can just answer, I do, at the appropriate time. The first statement is, do you dedicate yourselves to providing an atmosphere of reverence to God in your family, a spirit of dependence on God for all things great and small, and consistent exposure of your family to the word of God? You do. Do you dedicate yourselves to provide for your children with the daily assurance of love and the love of their Heavenly Father. Yep. And will you pray for and with your children, striving to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, continually pointing them to Christ Jesus as the only way, the truth and the life? Okay, church, now it's your turn. Would you all like to stand in with these uh, parents here and I have a question for you do you who make up part of the body of Christ at Grace Bible Fellowship dedicate yourselves to support these parents in their quest to bring up their children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord thank you you may be seated Okay, well, I've just got a few certificates here, Ethan and Levi, for you just to uh, remember this occasion and to remind you of the pledges made here today. Let us just um, close in prayer. Father, we thank you for these children and pray that as they grow, that they would be led to the foot of the cross, 
bless these parents and help them to remain faithful to the commitments and promises made this day to you and on behalf of their children as witnessed by this congregation. Help each of us in this congregation to fulfil our responsibility to pray for these children and to partner with their parents in providing the kind of environment that will bless them and lead them to a meaningful faith in Christ. Lord, for other parents here, we ask that you would work in their lives, empowering them to raise godly children that would lead them to the knowledge of Christ. We are so thankful that you have brought all these children safely to their families and to us at this church. How blessed are we, Lord. May we not stumble in our duty and love and nurture these little ones in the way everlasting. We ask these things through Jesus Christ, our Saviour and our Lord. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Joel.